Section 10 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Chapter 5. Special Expressions of Animals Continued. Part 2. Ruminants. Cattle and sheep are remarkable from displaying in so slight a degree their emotions or sensations, excepting that of extreme pain. A bull, when enraged, exhibits his rage only by the manner in which he holds his lowered head, with distended nostrils, and by bellowing. He also often paws the ground, but this pawing seems quite different from that of an impatient horse, for when the soil is loose he throws up clouds of dust. I believe that bulls act in this manner when irritated by flies, for the sake of driving them away. The wilder breeds of sheep and the chamois, when startled, stamp on the ground and whistle through their noses, and this serves as a danger signal to their comrades. The musk ox of the Arctic regions, when encountered, likewise stamps on the ground. How this stamping action arose I cannot conjecture, for from inquiries which I have made it does not appear that any of these animals fight with their forelegs. Some species of deer, when savage, display far more expression than do cattle, sheep, or goats, for, as has already been stated, they draw back their ears, grind their teeth, erect their hair, squeal, stamp on the ground, and brandish their horns. One day in the zoological gardens, the Formosan deer, Cervus sudaxis, approached me in a curious attitude, with his muzzle raised high up so that the horns were pressed back on his neck, the head being held rather obliquely. From the expression of his eye I felt sure that he was savage. He approached slowly, and as soon as he came close to the iron bars, he did not lower his head to butt at me, but suddenly bent it inwards and struck his horns with great force against the railings. Mr. Bartlett informs me that some other species of deer place themselves in the similar attitude when enraged. Monkeys The various species and genera of monkeys express their feelings in many different ways, and this fact is interesting, as in some degree bearing on the question whether the so-called races of man should be ranked as distinct species or varieties, for as we shall see in the following chapters, the different races of man express their emotions and sensations with remarkable uniformity throughout the world. Some of the expressive actions of monkeys are interesting in another way, namely from being closely analogous to those of man. As I have had no opportunity of observing any one species of the group under all circumstances, my miscellaneous remarks will be best arranged under different states of the mind. Pleasure, Joy, Affection it is not possible to distinguish in monkeys, at least without more experience than I have had, the expression of pleasure or joy from that of affection. Young chimpanzees make a kind of barking noise when pleased by the return of any one to whom they are attached. When this noise, which the keepers call a laugh, is uttered, the lips are protruded, but so they are under various other emotions. Nevertheless, I could perceive that when they were pleased, the form of the lips differed a little from that assumed when they were angered. If a young chimpanzee be tickled, and the armpits are particularly sensitive to tickling, as in the case of our children, a more decided chuckling or laughing sound is uttered, though the laughter is sometimes noiseless. The corners of the mouth are then drawn backwards, and this sometimes causes the lower eyelids to be slightly wrinkled. But this wrinkling, which is so characteristic of our own laughter, is more plainly seen in some other monkeys. The teeth in the upper jaw of the chimpanzee are not exposed when they utter their laughing noise, in which respect they differ from us. But their eyes sparkle and grow brighter, as Mr. W. L. Martin, who has particularly attended to their expression, states. Young orangs, when tickled, likewise grin and make a chuckling sound, and Mr. Martin says that their eyes grow brighter. As soon as their laughter ceases, an expression may be detected passing over their faces, which, as Mr. Wallace remarked to me, may be called a smile. I have also noticed something of the same kind with the chimpanzee. Dr. Duchenne, and I cannot quote a better authority, informs me that he kept a very tame monkey in his house for a year, and when he gave it during mealtime some choice delicacy, he observed that the corners of its mouth were slightly raised, thus an expression of satisfaction, partaking of the nature of an incipient smile, and resembling that often seen on the face of man, could be plainly perceived in this animal. The Cebus Azari, when rejoiced at again seeing a beloved person, utters a peculiar twittering, kitcherden, sound. It also expresses agreeable sensations by drawing back the corners of its mouth without producing any sound. 
Renger calls this movement laughter, but it would be more appropriately called a smile. The form of the mouth is different when either pain or terror is expressed, and high shrieks are uttered. Another species of Cebus in the zoological gardens, C. hypolusis, when pleased, makes a reiterated shrill note, and likewise draws back the corners of its mouth, apparently through the contraction of the same muscles as with us. So does the Barbary ape, Inuus echodatus, to an extraordinary degree, and I observed in this monkey that the skin of the lower eyelids then became much wrinkled. At the same time it rapidly moved its lower jaw or lips in a spasmodic manner, the teeth being exposed, but the noise produced was hardly more distinct than that which we sometimes call silent laughter. Two of the keepers affirmed that this slight sound was the animal's laughter, and when I expressed some doubt on this head, being at the time quite inexperienced, they made it attack or rather threaten a hated Antelus monkey living in the same compartment. Instantly the whole expression of the face of the Innu is changed. The mouth was opened much more widely, the canine teeth were more fully exposed, and a hoarse barking noise was uttered. The Anubis baboon, Cynocephalus anubis, was first insulted and put into a furious rage, as was easily done by his keeper, who then made friends with him and shook hands. As the reconciliation was effected, the baboon rapidly moved up and down his jaws and lips, and looked pleased. When we laugh heartily, a similar movement or quiver may be observed, more or less distinctly in our jaws, but with man the muscles of the chest are more particularly acted on, whilst with this baboon, and with some other monkeys, it is the muscles of the jaws and lips which are spasmodically affected. I have already had occasion to remark on the curious manner in which two or three species of Alacacus and the Sinopithecus niger draw back their ears and utter a slight jabbering noise when they are pleased by being caressed. With the Sinopithecus, the corners of the mouth are at the same time drawn backwards and upwards so that the teeth are exposed. Hence this expression would never be recognized by a stranger as one of pleasure. The crest of long hairs on the forehead is depressed, and apparently the whole skin of the head drawn backwards. The eyebrows are thus raised a little, and the eyes assume a staring appearance. The lower eyelids also become slightly wrinkled, but this wrinkling is not conspicuous, owing to the permanent transverse furrows on the face. Painful Emotions and Sensations With monkeys, the expression of slight pain or of any painful emotion, such as grief, vexation, jealousy, etc., is not easily distinguished from that of moderate anger, and these states of mind readily and quickly pass into each other. Grief, however, with some species is certainly exhibited by weeping. A woman who sold a monkey to the zoological society, believed to have come from Borneo, Macacus morris, or M. inornatus of Gray, said that it often cried, and Mr. Bartlett, as well as the keeper Mr. Sutton, have repeatedly seen it, when grieved, or even when much pitied, weeping so copiously that the tears roll down its cheeks. There is, however, something strange about this case, for two specimens subsequently kept in the gardens, and believed to be the same species, have never been seen to weep, though they were carefully observed by the keeper and myself when much distressed and loudly screaming. Renger states that the eyes of the Cebus azari fill with tears, but not sufficiently to overflow, when it is prevented getting some much-desired object or is much frightened. Humboldt also asserts that the eyes of the Calithrix Sayurius instantly fill with tears when it is seized with fear. But when this pretty little monkey in the zoological gardens was teased, so as to cry out loudly, this did not occur. I do not, however, wish to throw the least doubt on the accuracy of Humboldt's statement. The appearance of dejection in young orangs and chimpanzees, when out of health, is as plain and almost as pathetic as in the case of our children. This state of mind and body is shown by their listless movements, fallen countenances, dull eyes, and changed complexion. Anger. This emotion is often exhibited by many kinds of monkeys, and is expressed, as Mr. Martin remarks, in many different ways. Quote, Some species, when irritated, pout the lips, gaze with a fixed and savage glare on their foe, and make repeated short starts as if about to spring forward, uttering at the same time inward guttural sounds. Many display their anger by suddenly advancing, making abrupt starts, at the same time opening the mouth and pursing up the lips, so as to conceal the teeth. 
while the eyes are daringly fixed on the enemy, as if in savage defiance. Some, again, and principally the long-tailed monkeys, or gunons, display their teeth, and accompany their malicious grins with a sharp, abrupt, reiterated cry." Unquote. Mr. Sutton confirms the statement that some species uncover their teeth when enraged, whilst others conceal them by the protrusion of their lips, and some kinds draw back their ears. The Sinopithecus niger, lately referred to, acts in this manner, at the same time depressing the crest of hair on its forehead and showing its teeth, so that the movements of the features from anger are nearly the same as those from pleasure, and the two expressions can be distinguished only by those familiar with the animal. Baboons often show their passion and threaten their enemies in a very odd manner, namely, by opening their mouths widely as in the act of yawning. Mr. Bartlett has often seen two baboons, when first placed in the same compartment, sitting opposite to each other and thus alternately opening their mouths, and this action seems frequently to end in a real yawn. Mr. Bartlett believes that both animals wish to show to each other that they are provided with a formidable set of teeth, as is undoubtedly the case. As I could hardly credit the reality of this yawning gesture, Mr. Bartlett insulted an old baboon and put him into a violent passion, and he almost immediately thus acted. Some species of Macacus and Cereopithecus behave in the same manner. Baboons likewise show their anger, as was observed by Brehen, with those which he kept alive in Abyssinia, in another manner, namely by striking the ground with one hand, quote, like an angry man striking the table with his fist, unquote. I have seen this movement with the baboons in the zoological gardens, but sometimes the action seems rather to represent the searching for a stone or other object in their beds of straw. Mr. Sutton has often observed the face of the Macacus rhesus when much enraged, growing red. As he was mentioning this to me, another monkey attacked a rhesus, and I saw its face redden as plainly as that of a man in a violent passion. In the course of a few minutes, after the battle, the face of this monkey recovered its natural tint. At the same time that the face reddened, the naked posterior part of the body, which is always red, seemed to grow still redder, but I cannot positively assert that this was the case. When the mandrill is in any way excited, the brilliantly colored naked parts of the skin are said to become still more vividly colored. With several species of baboons, the ridge of the forehead projects much over the eyes and is studded with a few long hairs representing our eyebrows. These animals are always looking about them, and in order to look upwards they raise their eyebrows. They have thus, as it would appear, acquired the habit of frequently moving their eyebrows. However this may be, many kinds of monkeys, especially the baboons, when angered or in any way excited, rapidly and incessantly move their eyebrows up and down, as well as the hairy skin of their foreheads. As we associate, in the case of man, the raising and lowering of the eyebrows with definite states of the mind, the almost incessant movement of the eyebrows by monkeys gives them a senseless expression. I once observed a man who had a trick of continually raising his eyebrows without any corresponding emotion, and this gave to him a foolish appearance. So it is with some persons who keep the corners of their mouths a little drawn backwards and upwards, as if by an incipient smile, though at the time they are not amused or pleased. A young orang, made jealous by her keeper attending to another monkey, slightly uncovered her teeth, and uttering a peevish noise like tish shist turned her back on him. Both orangs and chimpanzees, when a little more angered, protrude their lips greatly and make a harsh barking noise. A young female chimpanzee, in a violent passion, presented a curious resemblance to a child in the same state. She screamed loudly with widely open mouth, the lips being retracted so that the teeth were fully exposed. She threw her arms wildly about, sometimes clasping them over her head. She rolled on the ground, sometimes on her back, sometimes on her belly, and bit everything within reach. A young gibbon, Hylobatis syndactylus, in a passion has been described as behaving in almost exactly the same manner. The lips of young orangs and chimpanzees are protruded, sometimes to a wonderful degree under various circumstances. They act thus not only when slightly angered, sulky, or disappointed, but when alarmed at anything. In one instance at the sight of a turtle, 
and likewise when pleased, but neither the degree of protrusion nor the shape of the mouth is exactly the same, as I believe, in all cases, and the sounds which are then uttered are different. The accompanying drawing represents a chimpanzee made sulky by an orange having been offered him and then taken away. A similar protrusion or pouting of the lips, though to a much slighter degree, may be seen in sulky children. Many years ago in the zoological gardens I placed a looking-glass on the floor before two young orangs, who, as far as it was known, had never before seen one. At first they gazed at their own images with the most steady surprise, and then changed their point of view. They then approached close and protruded their lips toward the image as if to kiss it, in exactly the same manner as they had previously done towards each other, when first placed a few days before in the same room. They next made all sorts of grimaces, and put themselves in various attitudes before the mirror. They pressed and rubbed the surface. They placed their hands at different distances behind it, looked behind it, and finally seemed almost frightened, started a little, became cross, and refused to look any longer. When we try to perform some little action which is difficult and requires precision, for instance to thread a needle, we generally close our lips firmly, for the sake, I presume, of not disturbing our movements by breathing, and I noticed the same action in a young orang. The poor little creature was sick and was amusing itself by trying to kill the flies on the window panes with its knuckles. This was difficult, as the flies buzzed about, and at each attempt the lips were firmly compressed and at the same time slightly protruded. Although the countenances, and more especially the gestures of orangs and chimpanzees, are in some respects highly expressive, I doubt whether on the whole they are so expressive as those of some other kinds of monkeys. This may be attributed in part to their ears being immovable, and in part to the nakedness of their eyebrows, of which the movements are thus rendered less conspicuous. When, however, they raise their eyebrows, their foreheads become, as with us, transversely wrinkled. In comparison with man, their faces are inexpressive, chiefly owing to their not frowning under any emotion of the mind, that is, as far as I have been able to observe, and I carefully attended to this point. Frowning, which is one of the most important of all the expressions in man, is due to the contraction of the corrugators by which the eyebrows are lowered and brought together, so that vertical furrows are formed on the forehead. Both the orang and chimpanzee are said to possess this muscle, but it seems rarely brought into action, at least in a conspicuous manner. I made my hands into a sort of cage, and placing some tempting fruit within, allowed both a young orang and chimpanzee to try their utmost to get it out. But although they grew rather cross, they showed not a trace of a frown, nor was there any frown when they were enraged. Twice I took two chimpanzees from their rather dark room suddenly into bright sunshine, which would certainly have caused us to frown. They blinked and winked their eyes, but only once did I see a very slight frown. On another occasion I tickled the nose of a chimpanzee with a straw, and as it crumpled up its face, slight vertical furrows appeared between the eyebrows. I have never seen a frown on the forehead of the orang. The gorilla, when enraged, is described as erecting its crest of hair, throwing down its under lip, dilating its nostrils, and uttering terrific yells. Messrs. Savage and Wyman state that the scalp can be freely moved backwards and forwards, and that when the animal is excited it is strongly contracted. But I presume that they mean by this latter expression that the scalp is lowered, for they likewise speak of the young chimpanzee when crying out as having the eyebrows strongly contracted. The great power of movement in the scalp of the gorilla, of many baboons and other monkeys, deserves notice in relation to the power possessed by some few men, either through reversion or persistence, of voluntarily moving their scalps. Astonishment, Terror A living freshwater turtle was placed at my request in the same compartment in the zoological gardens with many monkeys, and they showed unbounded astonishment, as well as some fear. This was displayed by their remaining motionless, staring intently with widely opened eyes, their eyebrows being often moved up and down. Their faces seemed somewhat lengthened. They occasionally raised themselves on their hind legs to get a better view. They often retreated a few feet, and then turning their heads over one shoulder, again stared intently. 
it was curious to observe how much less afraid they were of the turtle than of a living snake, which I had formerly placed in their compartment, for in the course of a few minutes some of the monkeys ventured to approach and touch the turtle. On the other hand, some of the larger baboons were greatly terrified, and grinned as if on the point of screaming out. When I showed a little dressed-up doll to the Sinopithecus niger, it stood motionless, stared intently with widely opened eyes, and advanced its ears a little forwards. But when the turtle was placed in its compartment, this monkey also moved its lips in an odd, rapid, jabbering manner, which the keeper declared was meant to conciliate or please the turtle. I was never able clearly to perceive that the eyebrows of the astonished monkeys were kept permanently raised, though they were frequently moved up and down. Attention, which precedes astonishment, is expressed by man by a slight raising of the eyebrows, and Dr. Duchenne informs me that when he gave to the monkey formerly mentioned some quite new article of food, it elevated its eyebrows a little, thus assuming an appearance of close attention. It then took the food in its fingers, and, with lowered or rectilinear eyebrows, scratched, smelt, and examined it, an expression of reflection being thus exhibited. Sometimes it would throw back its head a little, and again, with sudden raised eyebrows, re-examine, and finally taste the food. In no case did any monkey keep its mouth open when it was astonished. Mr. Sutton observed for me a young orang and chimpanzee during a considerable length of time, and however much they were astonished, or whilst listening intently to some strange sound, they did not keep their mouths open. This fact is surprising, as with mankind hardly any expression is more general than a widely open mouth under the sense of astonishment. As far as I have been able to observe, monkeys breathe more freely through their nostrils than men do, and this may account for their not opening their mouths when they are astonished. For as we shall see in a future chapter, man apparently acts in this manner when startled, at first for the sake of quickly drawing in a full inspiration, and afterwards for the sake of breathing as quietly as possible. Terror is expressed by many kinds of monkeys by the utterance of shrill screams, the lips being drawn back so that the teeth are exposed. The hair becomes erect, especially when some anger is likewise felt. Mr. Sutton has distinctly seen the face of the Macacus rhesus grow pale from fear. Monkeys also tremble from fear, and sometimes they void their excretions. I have seen one which, when caught, almost fainted from an excess of terror. Sufficient facts have now been given with respect to the expressions of various animals. It is impossible to agree with Sir C. Bell when he says that, quote, the faces of animals seem chiefly capable of expressing rage and fear, unquote. and again when he says that all their expressions, quote, may be referred, more or less plainly, to their acts of volition or necessary instincts, unquote. He who will look at a dog preparing to attack another dog or a man, and at the same animal when caressing his master, or will watch the countenance of a monkey when insulted and when fondled by his keeper, will be forced to admit that the movements of their features and their gestures are almost as expressive as those of man. Although no explanation can be given of some of the expressions in the lower animals, the greater number are explicable in accordance with the three principles given at the commencement of the first chapter. End of chapter 5. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Chapter 6. Special Expressions of Man. Suffering and Weeping. Part 1. The Screaming and Weeping of Infants. Forms of features, age at which weeping commences, the effects of habitual restraint on weeping, sobbing, cause of the contraction of the muscles round the eyes during screaming, cause of the secretion of tears. In this and the following chapters, the expressions exhibited by man under various states of the mind will be described and explained, as far as lies in my power. My observations will be arranged according to the order which I have found the most convenient, and this will generally lead to opposite emotions and sensations succeeding each other. Suffering of the body and mind. Weeping. 
I have already described in sufficient detail, in the third chapter, the signs of extreme pain, as shown by screams or groans, with the writhing of the whole body and the teeth clenched or ground together. These signs are often accompanied or followed by profuse sweating, pallor, trembling, other prostration, or faintness. No suffering is greater than that from extreme fear or horror, but here a distinct emotion comes into play, and will be elsewhere considered. Prolonged suffering, especially of the mind, passes into low spirits, grief, dejection, and despair, and these states will be the subject of the following chapter. Here I shall almost confine myself to weeping or crying, more especially in children. Infants, when suffering even slight pain, moderate hunger or discomfort, other violent and prolonged screams. Whilst thus screaming, their eyes are firmly closed, so that the skin round them is wrinkled, and the forehead contracted into a frown. The mouth is widely opened with the lips retracted in a peculiar manner, which causes it to assume a squarish form, the gums or teeth being more or less exposed. The breath is inhaled almost spasmodically. It is easy to observe infants whilst screaming, but I have found photographs made by the instantaneous process the best means for observation, as allowing more deliberation. I have collected twelve, most of them made purposely for me, and they all exhibit the same general characteristics. I have, therefore, had six of them reproduced by the heliotype process. The firm closing of the eyelids and consequent compression of the eyeball, and this is a most important element in various expressions, serves to protect the eyes from becoming too much gorged with blood, as will presently be explained in detail. With respect to the order in which the several muscles contract in firmly compressing the eyes, I am indebted to Dr. Langstaff of Southampton for some observations which I have since repeated. The best plan for observing the order is to make a person first raise his eyebrows, and this produces transverse wrinkles across the forehead, and then very gradually to contract all the muscles round the elves with as much force as possible. The reader who is unacquainted with the anatomy of the face ought to refer to page 24, and look at the woodcuts 1 to 3. The corrugators of the brow, corrugator supercilii, seem to be the first muscles to contract, and these draw the eyebrows downwards and inwards toward the base of the nose, causing vertical furrows, that is a frown, to appear between the eyebrows. At the same time, they cause the disappearance of the transverse wrinkles across the forehead. The orbicular muscles contract almost simultaneously with the corrugators, and produce wrinkles all round the eyes. They appear, however, to be enabled to contract with greater force, as soon as the contraction of the corrugators has given them some support. Lastly, the pyramidal muscles of the nose contract, and these draw the eyebrows and the skin of the forehead still lower down, producing short transverse wrinkles across the base of the nose. For the sake of brevity, these muscles will generally be spoken of as the orbiculars, or as those surrounding the eyes. When these muscles are strongly contracted, those running to the upper lip likewise contract and raise the upper lip. This might have been expected from the manner in which at least one of them, the malaris, is connected with the orbiculars. Anyone who will gradually contract the muscles round his eyes will feel, as he increases the force, that his upper lip and the wings of his nose, which are partly acted on by one of the same muscles, are almost always a little drawn up. If he keeps his mouth firmly shut whilst contracting the muscles round his eyes, and then suddenly relaxes his lips, he will feel that the pressure on his eyes immediately increases. 
So again, when a person on a bright glaring day wishes to look at a distant object, but is compelled partially to close his eyelids, the upper lip may almost always be observed to be somewhat raised. The mouths of some short-sighted persons, who are forced habitually to reduce the aperture of their eyes, wear from the same reason a grinning expression. The raising of the upper lip draws upwards the flesh of the upper parts of the cheeks, and produces a strongly marked fold on each cheek, the nasolabial fold, which runs from near the wings of the nostrils to the corners of the mouth and below them. This fold or furrow may be seen in all the photographs, and is very characteristic of the expression of a crying child, though a nearly similar fold is produced in the act of laughing or smiling. As the upper lip is much drawn up during the act of screaming, in the manner just explained, the depressor muscles of the angles of the mouth, CK in woodcuts 1 and 2, are strongly contracted in order to keep the mouth widely open, so that a full volume of sound may be poured forth. The actions of these opposed muscles, above and below, tends to give to the mouth an oblong, almost squarish outline, as may be seen in the accompanying photographs. An excellent observer, in describing a baby crying whilst being fed, says, Quote, it made its mouth like a square, and to let the porridge run out at all four corners. End quote. I believe, but we shall return to this point in a future chapter, that the depressor muscles of the angles of the mouth are less under the separate control of the will than the adjoining muscles, so that if a young child is only doubtfully inclined to cry, this muscle is generally the first to contract and is the last to cease contracting. When older children commence crying, the muscles which run to the upper lip are often the first to contract, and this may perhaps be due to older children not having so strong a tendency to scream loudly, and consequently to keep their mouths widely open, so that the above-named depressor muscles are not brought into such strong action. With one of my own infants, from his eighth day and for some time afterwards, I often observed that the first sign of a screaming fit, when it could be observed coming on gradually, was a little frown, owing to the contraction of the corrugators of the brows, the capillaries of the naked head and face becoming at the same time reddened with blood. As soon as the screaming fit actually began, all the muscles round the eyes were strongly contracted, and the mouth widely opened in the man layer above described, so that at this early period the features assumed the same form as a more advanced age. Dr. Pydrit lays great stress on the contraction of certain muscles which draw down the nose and narrow the nostrils, as eminently characteristic of a crying expression. The depressors anguli oris, as we have just seen, are usually contracted at the same time, and they indirectly tend, according to Dr. Duchenne, to act in the same manner on the nose. With children having bad colds, a similar pinched appearance of the nose may be noticed, which is at least partly due, as remarked to me by Dr. Langstaff, to their constant snuffling and the consequent pressure of the atmosphere on the two sides. The purpose of this contraction of the nostrils by children having bad colds, or whilst crying, seems to be to cheek the downward flow of the mucus and tears, and to prevent these fluids spreading over the upper lip. After a prolonged and severe screaming fit, the scalp, face, and eyes are reddened, owing to the return of the blood from the head having been impeded by the violent expiratory efforts. But the redness of the stimulated eyes is chiefly due to the copious effusion of tears. The various muscles of the face, which have been strongly contracted, still twitch a little, 
and the upper lip is slightly drawn up or averted, with the corners of the mouth still a little drawn downwards. I have myself felt, and have observed in other grown-up persons, that when tears are restrained with difficulty, as in reading a pathetic story, it is almost impossible to prevent the various muscles with which young children are brought into strong action during their screaming fits, from slightly twitching or trembling. Infants whilst young do not shed tears or weep, as is well known to nurses and medical men. This circumstance is not exclusively due to the lacrimal glands being as yet incapable of secreting tears. I first noticed this fact from having accidentally brushed with the cuff of my coat the open eye of one of my infants, when seventy-seven days old, causing his eye to water freely, and though the child screamed violently, the other eye remained dry, or was only slightly suffused with tears. A similar slight effusion occurred ten days previously in both eyes during a screaming fit. The tears did not run over the eyelids and roll down the cheeks of this child, whilst screaming badly, when 122 days old. This first happened 17 days later, at the age of 139 days. A few other children had been observed for me, and the period of free weeping appears to be very variable. In one case, the eyes became slightly suffused at the age of only 20 days, in another at 62 days. With two other children, the tears did not run down the face at the ages of 84 and 110 days, but in a third child they did run down at the age of 104 days. In one instance, as I was positively assured, tears ran down at the unusually early age of 42 days. It would appear as if the lacrimal glands required some practice in the individual before they are easily excited into action, in somewhat the same manner as various inherited consensual movements and tastes require some exercise before they are fixed and perfected. This is all the more likely with a habit like weeping, which must have been acquired since the period when man branched off from the common progenitor of the genus Homo and of the non-weeping anthropomorphous apes. The fact of tears not being shed at a very early age from pain or any mental emotion is remarkable, as, later in life, no expression is more general or more strongly marked than weeping. When the habit has once been acquired by an infant, it expresses in the clearest manner suffering of all kinds, both bodily pain and mental distress, even though accompanied by other emotions, such as fear or rage. The character of the crying, however, changes at a very early age, as I noticed in my own infants, the passionate cry differing from that of grief. A lady informs me that her child, nine months old, when in a passion, screams loudly, but does not weep. Tears, however, are shed when she is punished by her chair being turned with its back to the table. This difference may perhaps be attributed to weeping being restrained, as we shall immediately see, at a more advanced age, under most circumstances except in grief and to the influence of such restraint being transmitted to an earlier period of life than that at which it was first practiced. With adults, especially of the male sex, weeping soon ceases to be caused by, or to express, bodily pain. This may be accounted for by its being thought weak and unmanly by men, both of civilized and barbarous races, to exhibit bodily pain by any outward sign. With this exception, savages weep copiously from very slight causes, of which fact Sir J. Lubbock has collected instances. A New Zealand chief, quote, 
cried like a child, because the sailor spoilt his favorite cloak by powdering it with flour. End quote. I saw in Tierra del Fuego a native who had lately lost a brother, and who had alternately cried with hysterical violence, and laughed heartily at anything which amused him. With the civilized nations of Europe, there is also much difference in the frequency of weeping. Englishmen rarely cry, except under the pressure of the acutest grief, whereas in some parts of the continent the men shed tears much more readily and freely. The insane notoriously give way to all their emotions with little or no restraint, and I am informed by Dr. J. Crichton Brown that nothing is more characteristic of simple melancholia, even in the male sex, than a tendency to weep on the slightest occasions, or from no cause. They also weep disproportionately on the occurrence of any real cause of grief. The length of time during which some patients weep is astonishing, as well as the amount of tears which they shed. One melancholic girl wept for a whole day, and afterwards confessed to Dr. Brown that it was because she remembered that she had once shaved off her eyebrows to promote their growth. Many patients in the asylum sit for a long time, rocking themselves backwards and forwards, quote, and if spoken to, they stop their movements, purse up their eyes, depress the corners of the mouth, and burst out crying, end quote. In some of these cases, being spoken to or kindly greeted appears to suggest some fanciful and sorrowful notion, but in other cases, an effort of any kind excites weeping, independently of any sorrowful idea. Patients suffering from acute mania likewise have paroxysms of violent crying or blubbering in the midst of their incoherent ravings. We must not, however, lay too much stress on the copious shedding of tears by the insane, as being due to the lack of all restraint. For certain brain diseases, as hemiplegia, brain wasting, and senile decay, have a special tendency to induce weeping. Weeping is common in the insane, even after a complete state of fatuity has been reached, and the power of speech lost. Persons born idiotic likewise weep, but it is said that this is not the case with Cretans. Weeping seems to be the primary and natural expression, as we see in children, of suffering of any kind, whether bodily pain short of extreme agony, or mental distress. But the foregoing facts and common experience show us that a frequently repeated effort to restrain weeping, in association with certain states of the mind, does much in checking the habit. On the other hand, it appears that the power of weeping can be increased through habit. Thus the Reverend R. Taylor, who long resided in New Zealand, asserts that the women can voluntarily shed tears in abundance. They meet for this purpose to mourn for the dead, and they take pride in crying, quote, in the most affecting manner, end quote. A single effort of repression brought to bear on the lacrimal glands does little, and indeed seems often to lead to an opposite result. An old and experienced physician told me that he had always found that the only means to check the occasional bitter weeping of ladies who consulted him, and who themselves wished to desist, was earnestly to beg them not to try, and to assure them that nothing would relieve them so much as prolonged and copious crying. The screaming of infants consists of prolonged expirations, with short and rapid, almost spasmodic inspirations, followed at a somewhat more advanced age by sobbing. According to Gradiole, the glottis is chiefly affected during the act of sobbing. This sound is heard, quote, at the moment when the inspiration conquers the resistance of the glottis, and the air rushes into the chest, end quote. 
but the whole act of respiration is likewise spasmodic and violent. The shoulders are at the same time generally raised, as by this movement respiration is rendered easier. With one of my infants, when seventy-seven days old, the inspirations were so rapid and strong that they approached in character to sobbing. When one hundred and thirty-eight days old, I first noticed distinct sobbing, which subsequently followed every bad crying fit. The respiratory movements are partly voluntary and partly involuntary, and I apprehend that sobbing is at least in part due to children having some power to command after early infancy their vocal organs and to stop their screams. But from having less power over their respiratory muscles, these continue for a time to act in an involuntary or spasmodic manner, as having been brought into violent action. Sobbing seems to be peculiar to the human species, for the keepers in the zoological gardens assure me that they have never heard a sob from any kind of monkey, though monkeys often scream loudly whilst being chased and caught, and then pant for a long time. We thus see that there is a close analogy between sobbing and the free shedding of tears, for with children, sobbing does not commence during early infancy, but afterwards comes on rather suddenly and then follows every bad crying fit until the habit is checked with advancing years. On the cause of the contraction of the muscles round the eyes during screaming. We have seen that infants and young children, whilst screaming, invariably close their eyes firmly by the contraction of the surrounding muscles, so that the skin becomes wrinkled all around. With older children, and even with adults, Whenever there is violent and unrestrained crying, a tendency to the contraction of these same muscles may be observed, though this is often checked in order not to interfere with vision. Sir C. Bell explains this action in the following manner, quote, During every violent act of expiration, whether in hearty laughter, weeping, coughing, or sneezing, the eyeball is firmly compressed by the fibers of the orbicularis, and this is a provision for supporting and defending the vascular system of the interior of the eye from a retrograde impulse communicated to the blood in the veins at the same time. When we contract the chest and expel the air, there is a retardation of the blood in the veins of the neck and head, and in the more powerful acts of expulsion, the blood not only distends the vessels, but is even regurgitated into the minute branches. Were the eye not properly compressed at the time, and a resistance given to the shock, irreparable injury might be inflicted on the delicate textures of the interior of the eye. End quote. He further adds, quote, If we separate the eyelids of a child to examine the eye, while it cries and struggles with passion, by taking off the natural support to the vacular system of the eye, and means of guarding it against the rush of blood then occurring, the conjunctiva becomes suddenly filled with blood, and the eyelids averted. End quote. Not only are the muscles round the eye strongly contracted, as Sir C. Bell states, and as I have often observed, during screaming, loud laughter, coughing and sneezing, but during several other analogous actions. A man contracts these muscles when he violently blows his nose. I asked one of my boys to shout as loudly as he possibly could, and as soon as he began, he firmly contracted his orbicular muscles. I observed this repeatedly, and on asking him why he had every time so firmly closed his eyes, I found that he was quite unaware of the fact. He had acted instinctively or unconsciously. It is not necessary, in order to lead to the contraction of these muscles, that the air should actually be expelled from the chest. It suffices that the muscles of the chest and abdomen should contract with great force, whilst by the closure of the glottis 
no air escapes. In violent vomiting or retching, the diaphragm is made to descend by the chest being filled with air. It is then held in this position by the closure of the glottis, quote, as well as by the contraction of its own fibers, end quote. The abdominal muscles now contract strongly upon the stomach, its proper muscles likewise contracting, and the contents are thus ejected. During each effort of vomiting, quote, the head becomes greatly congested, so that the features are red and swollen, and the large veins of the face and temples visibly dilated, end quote. At the same time, as I know from observation, the muscles round the eyes are strongly contracted. This is likewise the case when the abdominal muscles act downwards with unusual force in expelling the contents of the intestinal canal. The greatest exertion of the muscles of the body, if those of the chest are not brought into action in expelling or compressing the air within the lungs, does not lead to the contraction of the muscles round the eyes. I have observed my sons using great force in gymnastic exercises, as in repeatedly raising their suspended bodies by their arms alone, and in lifting heavy weights from the ground, but there was hardly any trace of contraction in the muscles round the eyes. As the contraction of these muscles for the protection of the eyes during violent expiration is indirectly, as we shall hereafter see, a fundamental element in several of our most important expressions, I was extremely anxious to ascertain how far Sir C. Bell's view could be substantiated. Professor Donders, of Utrecht, well known as one of the highest authorities in Europe on vision and on the structure of the eye, has most kindly undertaken for me this investigation with the aid of the many ingenious mechanisms of modern science and has published the results. He shows that during violent expiration, the external, the intraocular, and the retroocular vessels of the eye are all affected in two ways, namely by the increased pressure of the blood in the arteries, and by the return of the blood in the veins being impeded. It is, therefore, certain that both the arteries and the veins of the eye are more or less distended during violent expiration. The evidence in detail may be found in Professor Donder's valuable memoir. We see the effects on the veins of the head, in their prominence, and in the purple color of the face of a man who coughs violently from being half choked. I may mention, on the same authority, that the whole eye certainly advances a little during each violent expiration. This is due to the dilatation of the retroocular vessels, and might have been expected from the intimate connection of the eye and the brain, the brain being known to rise and fall with each respiration when the portion of the skull has been removed, and as may be seen along the unclosed sutures of infants' heads. This also, I presume, is the reason that the eyes of a strangled man appear as if they are starting from their sockets. With respect to the protection of the eye during violent expiratory efforts by the pressure of the eyelids, Professor Donders concludes from his various observations that this action certainly limits or entirely removes the dilatation of the vessels. At such times, he adds, we not unfrequently see the hand involuntarily laid upon the eyelids, as if the better to support and defend the eyeball. Nevertheless, much evidence cannot at present be advanced to prove that the eye actually suffers injury from the want of support during violent expiration, but there is some. It is, quote, a fact that forcible expiratory effort in violent coughing or vomiting, and especially in sneezing, sometimes give rise to ruptures of the little external vessels end quote, of the eye. With respect to the internal vessels, 
Dr. Gunning has lately recorded a case of exothalamus in consequence of whooping cough, which in his opinion depended on the rupture of the deeper vessels, and another analogous case has been recorded. But a mere sense of discomfort would probably suffice to lead to the associated habit of protecting the eyeball by the contraction of the surrounding muscles. Even the expectation or chance of injury would probably be sufficient, in the same manner as an object moving too near the eye induces involuntary winking of the eyelids. We may, therefore, safely conclude from Sir C. Bell's observations, and more especially from the more careful investigations by Professor Donders, that the firm closure of the eyelids during the screaming of children is an action full of meaning and of real service. We have already seen that the contraction of the orbicular muscles leads to the drawing up of the upper lip, and consequently, if the mouth is kept widely open, to the drawing down of the corners by the contraction of the depressor muscles. The formation of the nasolabial fold on the cheeks likewise follows from the drawing up of the upper lip. Thus all the chief expressive movements of the face during crying apparently result from the contraction of the muscles round the eyes. We shall also find that the shedding of tears depends on, or at least stands in some connection with, the contraction of these same muscles. In some of the foregoing cases, especially in those of sneezing and coughing, it is possible that the contraction of the orbicular muscles may serve in addition to protect the eyes from too severe a jar or vibration. I think so, because dogs and cats, in crunching hard bones, always close their eyelids, and at least sometimes in sneezing, though dogs do not do so whilst barking loudly. Mr. Sutton carefully observed for me a young orangutan and chimpanzee, and he found that both always closed their eyes in sneezing and coughing but not whilst screaming violently. I give a small pinch of snuff to a monkey of the American division, namely a cebus, and it closed its eyelids whilst sneezing, but not on a subsequent occasion whilst uttering loud cries. End of section 11. Section 12 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Chapter 6. Special Expressions of Man. Suffering and Weeping. Part 2. Cause of the Secretion of Tears. It is an important fact which must be considered in any theory of the secretion of tears from the mind being affected, that whenever the muscles around the eyes are strongly and involuntarily contracted in order to compress the blood vessels and thus to protect the eyes, tears are secreted, often in sufficient abundance to roll down the cheeks. This occurs under the most opposite emotions, and under no emotion at all. The sole exception, and this is only a partial one, to the existence of a relation between the involuntary and strong contraction of these muscles and the secretion of tears, is that of young infants who whilst screaming violently with their eyelids firmly closed, do not commonly weep until they have attained the age of from two to three or four months. Their eyes, however, become suffused with tears at a much earlier age. It would appear, as already remarked, that the lacrimal glands do not, from the want of practice or some other cause, come to full functional activity at a very early period of life. With children at a somewhat later age, crying out or wailing from any distress is so regularly accompanied by the shedding of tears that weeping and crying are synonymous terms. Under the opposite emotion of great joy or amusement, as long as laughter is moderate, there is hardly any contraction of the muscles round the eyes so that there is no frowning. But when peals of loud laughter are uttered, with the rapid and violent spasmodic expirations, 
tears stream down the face. I have more than once noticed the face of a person, after a paroxysm of violent laughter, and I could see that the orbicular muscles and those running to the upper lip were still partially contracted, which together with the tear-stained cheeks gave to the upper half of the face an expression not to be distinguished from that of a child still blubbering from grief. The fact of tears streaming down the face during violent laughter is common to all the races of mankind, as we shall see in a future chapter. In violent coughing, especially when a person is half-choked, the face becomes purple, the veins distended, the orbicular muscles strongly contracted, and tears run down the cheeks. Even after a fit of ordinary coughing, almost everyone has to wipe his eyes. In violent vomiting or retching, as I have myself experienced and seen in others, the orbicular muscles are strongly contracted, and tears sometimes flow freely down the cheeks. It has been suggested to me that this may be due to irritating matter being injected into the nostrils, and causing by reflex action the secretion of tears. Accordingly, I asked one of my informants, a surgeon, to attend to the effects of retching when nothing was thrown up from the stomach, and, by an odd coincidence, he himself suffered the next morning from an attack of retching, and three days subsequently observed a lady under a similar attack, and he is certain that in neither case an atom of matter was ejected from the stomach, yet the orbicular muscles were strongly contracted, and tears freely secreted. I can also speak positively to the energetic contraction of these same muscles round the eyes, and to the coincident free secretion of tears. When the abdominal muscles act with unusual force in a downward direction on the intestinal canal. Yawning commences with a deep inspiration, followed by a long and forcible expiration, and at the same time almost all the muscles of the body are strongly contracted, including those round the eyes. During this act tears are often secreted, and I have seen them even rolling down the cheeks. I have frequently observed that when persons scratch some point which itches intolerably, they forcibly close their eyelids, but they do not, as I believe, first draw a deep breath and then expel it with force, and I have never noticed that the eyes then become filled with tears. But I am not prepared to assert that this does not occur. The forcible closure of the eyelids is, perhaps, merely a part of that general action by which almost all the muscles of the body are at the same time rendered rigid. It is quite different from the gentle closure of the eyes which often accompanies, as Gradiole remarks, the smelling a delicious odor, or the tasting a delicious morsel and which probably originates in the desire to shut out any disturbing impressions through the eyes. Professor Donders writes to me to the following effect, Quote, I have observed some cases of a very curious affection when, after a slight rub, a tushaman, for example, from the friction of a coat, which caused neither a wound nor a contusion, Spasms of the orbicular muscles occurred, with a very profuse flow of tears, lasting about one hour. Subsequently, sometimes after an interval of several weeks, violent spasms of the same muscles reoccurred, accompanied by the secretion of tears, together with primary or secondary redness of the eye. End quote. Mr. Bowman informs me that he has occasionally observed closely analogous cases, and that, in some of these, there was no redness or inflammation of the eyes. I was anxious to ascertain whether there existed in any of the lower animals 
a similar relation between the contraction of the orbicular muscles during violent expiration and the secretion of tears. But there are very few animals which contract these muscles in a prolonged manner, or which shed tears. The Macacus maurus, which formerly wept so copiously in the zoological gardens, would have been a fine case for observation. But the two monkeys now there, and which are believed to belong to the same species, do not weep. Nevertheless, they were carefully observed by Mr. Bartlett and myself, whilst screaming loudly. And they seemed to contract these muscles, but they moved about their cages so rapidly that it was difficult to observe with certainty. No other monkey, as far as I have been able to ascertain, contracts its orbicular muscles whilst screaming. The Indian elephant is known sometimes to weep. Sir E. Tennant, in describing these which he saw captured and bound in Ceylon, says, Some, quote, lay motionless on the ground, with no other indication of suffering than the tears which suffused their eyes and flowed incessantly. End quote. Speaking of another elephant, he says, quote, When overpowered and made fast, his grief was most affecting. His violence sank to other prostration. And he lay on the ground, uttering choking cries, with tears trickling down his cheeks. End quote. In the zoological gardens, the keeper of the Indian elephants positively asserts that he has several times seen tears rolling down the face of the old female, when distressed by the removal of the young one. Hence I was extremely anxious to ascertain, as an extension of the relation between the contraction of the orbicular muscles and the shedding of tears in man, whether elephants, when screaming or trumpeting loudly, contract these muscles. At Mr. Bartlett's desire, the keeper ordered the old and the young elephant to trumpet, and we repeatedly saw in both animals that, just as the trumpeting began, the orbicular muscles, especially in the lower ones, were distinctly contracted. On a subsequent occasion, the keeper made the old elephant trumpet much more loudly, and invariably both the upper and lower orbicular muscles were strongly contracted, and now in an equal degree. It is a singular fact that the African elephant, which, however, is so different from the Indian species that it is placed by some naturalists in a distinct subgenus, when made on two occasions to trumpet loudly, exhibited no trace of the contraction of the orbicular muscles. From the several foregoing cases with respect to man, there can, I think, be no doubt that the contraction of the muscles round the eyes, during violent expiration or when the expanded chest is forcibly compressed, is, in some manner, intimately connected with the secretion of tears. This holds good under widely different emotions, and independently of any emotion. It is not, of course, meant that tears cannot be secreted without the contractions of these muscles, for it is notorious that they are often freely shed with the eyelids not closed, and with the brows unwrinkled. The contraction must be both involuntary and prolonged, as during a choking fit, or energetic, as during a sneeze. The mere involuntary winking of the eyelids, though often repeated, does not bring tears into the eyes, nor does the voluntary and prolonged contraction of the several surrounding muscles suffice. As the lacrimal glands of children are easily excited, I persuaded my own and several other children of different ages to contract these muscles repeatedly with their utmost force, and to continue doing so as long as they possibly could, but this produced hardly any effect. There was sometimes a little moisture in the eyes, 
but not more than apparently could be accounted for by the squeezing out of the already secreted tears within the glands. The nature of the relation between the involuntary and energetic contraction of the muscles round the eyes, and the secretion of tears, cannot be positively ascertained, but a probable view may be suggested. The primary function of the secretion of tears, together with some mucus, is to lubricate the surface of the eye, and the secondary one, as some believe, is to keep the nostrils damp so that the inhaled air may be moist, and likewise to favor the power of smelling. But another, and at least equally important function of tears, is to wash out particles of dust or other minute objects which may get into the eyes. That this is of great importance is clear from the cases in which the cornea has been rendered opaque through inflammation, caused by particles of dust not being removed, in consequence of the eye and eyelid becoming immovable. The secretion of tears from the irritation of any foreign body in the eye is a reflex action, that is, the body irritates a peripheral nerve which sends an impression to certain sensory nerve cells. These transmit an influence to other cells and these again to the lacrimal glands. The influence transmitted to these glands causes, as there is good reason to believe, the relaxation of the muscular coats of the smaller arteries. This allows more blood to permeate the glandular tissue, and this induces a free secretion of tears. When the small arteries of the face including those of the retina, are relaxed under very different circumstances, namely, during an intense blush, the lacrimal glands are sometimes affected in a like manner, for the eyes become suffused with tears. It is difficult to conjecture how many reflex actions have originated, but, in relation to the present case of the affection of the lacrimal glands through irritation of the surface of the eye, it may be worth remarking that, as soon as some primordial form became semi-terrestrial in its habits, and was liable to get particles of dust into its eyes, if these were not washed out, they would cause much irritation, and on the principle of the radiation of nerve force to adjoining nerve cells, the lacrimal glands would be stimulated to secretion. As this would often recur, and as nerve force readily passes along accustomed channels, a slight irritation would ultimately suffice to cause a free secretion of tears. As soon as by this, or by some other means, a reflex action of this nature had been established and rendered easy, other stimulants applied to the surface of the eye, such as a cold wind, slow inflammatory action, or a blow on the eyelids, would cause a copious secretion of tears, as we know to be the case. The glands are also excited into action through the irritation of adjoining parts. Thus, when the nostrils are irritated by pungent vapors, though the eyelids may be kept firmly closed, tears are copiously secreted, and this likewise follows from a blow on the nose for instance, from a boxing glove. A stinging switch on the face produces, as I have seen, the same effect. In these latter cases, the secretion of tears is an incidental result, and of no direct service. As all these parts of the face, including the lacrimal glands, are supplied with branches of the same nerve, namely the fifth, it is in some degree intelligible that the effects of the excitement of any one branch should spread to the nerve cells or roots of the other branches. The internal parts of the eye likewise act, under certain conditions, in the reflex manner on the lacrimal glands. The following statements have been kindly communicated to me by Mr. Bowman, but the subject is a very intricate one 
as all the parts of the eye are so intimately related together, and are so sensitive to various stimulants. A strong light acting on the retina, when in a normal condition, has very little tendency to cause lacrimation, but with unhealthy children having small, old-standing ulcers on the cornea, the retina becomes excessively sensitive to light, and exposure even to common daylight causes forcible and sustained closure of the eyelids, and a profuse flow of tears. When persons who ought to begin the use of convex glasses habitually strain the waning power of accommodation, an undue secretion of tears very often follows, and the retina is liable to become unduly sensitive to light. In general, morbid affections of the surface of the eye and of the ciliary structures concerned in the accommodative act are prone to be accompanied with excessive secretion of tears. Hardness of the eyeball, not rising to inflammation, but implying a want of balance between the fluids poured out and again taken up by the intraocular vessels, is not usually attended with any lacrimation. When the balance is on the other side, and the eye becomes too soft, there is a great tendency to lacrimation. Finally, there are numerous morbid states and structural alterations of the eyes, and even terrible inflammations, which may be attended with little or no secretion of tears. It also deserves notice, as indirectly bearing on our subject, that the eye and adjoining parts are subject to an extraordinary number of reflex and associated movements, sensations, and actions besides those relating to the lacrimal glands. When a bright light strikes the retina of one eye alone, the iris contracts, but the iris of the other eye moves after a measurable interval of time. The iris likewise moves in accommodation to near or distant vision, and when the two eyes are made to converge. Everyone knows how irresistibly the eyebrows are drawn down under an intensely bright light. The eyelids also involuntarily wink when an object is moved near the eyes, or a sound is suddenly heard. A well-known case of a bright light causing some person to sneeze is even more curious. The nerve force here radiates from certain nerve cells in connection with the retina to the sensory nerve cells of the nose causing it to tickle, and from these to the cells which command the various respiratory muscles, the orbiculars included, which expel the air in so peculiar a manner that it rushes through the nostrils alone. To return to our point, why are tears secreted during a screaming fit or other violent expiratory efforts? as a slight blow on the eyelids causes a copious secretion of tears, it is at least possible that this spasmodic contraction of the eyelids by strongly pressing on the eyeball should in a similar manner cause some secretion. This seems possible, although the voluntary contraction of the same muscles does not produce any such effect. We know that a man cannot voluntarily sneeze or cough with nearly the same force as he does automatically. And so it is with the contraction of the orbicular muscles. Sir C. Bell experimented on them, and found that, by suddenly and forcibly closing the eyelids in the dark, sparks of light are seen, like those caused by tapping the eyelids with the fingers. Quote, but in sneezing the compression is both more rapid and more forcible and the sparks are more brilliant." End quote. That these sparks are due to the contractions of the eyelids is clear, because if they, quote, are held open during the act of sneezing, no sensation of light will be experienced. End quote. In the peculiar cases referred to by Professor Donders and Mr. Bowman, 
we have seen that some weeks after the eye has been very slightly injured, spasmodic contractions of the eyelids ensue, and these are accompanied by a profuse flow of tears. In the act of yawning, the tears are apparently due solely to the spasmodic contraction of the muscles round the eyes. Notwithstanding these latter cases, it seems hardly credible that the pressure of the eyelids on the surface of the eye, although affected spasmodically and therefore with much greater force than can be done voluntarily, should be sufficient to cause by reflex action the secretion of tears in the many cases in which this occurs during violent expiratory efforts. Another cause may come conjointly into play. We have seen that the internal parts of the eye, under certain conditions, act in a reflex manner on the lacrimal glands. We know that during violent expiratory efforts, the pressure of the arterial blood within the vessels of the eye is increased, and that the return of the venous blood is impeded. It seems, therefore, not improbable that the distension of the ocular vessels, thus induced, might act by reflection on the lacrimal glands. The effects due to the spasmodic pressure of the eyelids on the surface of the eye being thus increased. In considering how far this view is probable, we should bear in mind that the eyes of infants have been acted on in this double manner during numberless generations, whenever they have screamed, and on the principle of nerve force readily passing along accustomed channels, even a moderate compression of the eyeballs and a moderate distension of the ocular vessels would ultimately come, through habit, to act on the glands. We have an analogous case in the orbicular muscles being almost always contracted in some slight degree, even during a gentle crying fit, when there can be no distension of the vessels and no uncomfortable sensation excited within the eyes. Moreover, when complex actions or movements have long been performed in strict association together, and these are from any cause at first voluntarily and afterwards habitually checked, then if the proper exciting conditions occur, any part of the action or movement which is least under the control of the will will often be still involuntarily performed. The secretion by a gland is remarkably free from the influence of the will. Therefore, when with the advancing age of the individual, or with the advancing culture of the race, the habit of crying out or screaming is restrained, and there is consequently no distension of the blood vessels of the eye. It may nevertheless well happen that tears should still be secreted. We may see, as lately remarked, the muscles round the eyes of a person who reads a pathetic story, twitching or trembling in so slight a degree as hardly to be detected. In this case, there has been no screaming and no distension of the blood vessels. Yet through habit, certain nerve cells send a small amount of nerve force to the cells commanding the muscles round the eyes, and they likewise send some to the cells commanding the lacrimal glands, for the eyes often become at the same time just moistened with tears. If the twitching of the muscles round the eyes and the secretion of tears had been completely prevented, nevertheless it is almost certain that there would have been some tendency to transmit their force in these same directions, and as the lacrimal glands are remarkably free from the control of the will, they would be eminently liable still to act, thus betraying, though there were no other outward signs, the pathetic thoughts which were passing through the person's mind. As a further illustration of the view here advanced, I may remark that, during an earlier period of life, when habits of all kinds are readily established, our infants, when pleased, have been accustomed to other loud peals of laughter, during which the vessels of their eyes are distended, as often and as continuously 
as they have yielded when distressed to screaming fits. Then it is probable that in after life, tears would have been as copiously and as regularly secreted under the one state of mind as under the other. Gentle laughter or a smile, or even a pleasing thought, would have sufficed to cause a moderate secretion of tears. There does indeed exist an evident tendency in this direction, as will be seen in a future chapter, when we treat of the tender feelings. With the Sandwich Islanders, according to Freycinet, tears are actually recognized as a sign of happiness, but we should require better evidence on this head than that of a passing voyager. So again, if our infants, during many generations, and each of them during several years, had almost daily suffered from prolonged choking fits, during which the vessels of the eyes are distended and tears copiously secreted, then it is probable, such is the force of associated habit, that during after life the mere thought of a choke, without any distress of mind, would have sufficed to bring tears into our eyes. To sum up this chapter, weeping is probably the result of some such chain of events as follows. Children, when wanting food or suffering in any way, cry out loudly, like the young of most other animals, partly as a call to their parents for aid, and partly from any great exertion serving relief. Prolonged screaming inevitably leads to the gorging of the blood vessels of the eye, and this will have led, at first consciously and at last habitually, to the contraction of the muscles round the eye in order to protect them. At the same time, the spasmodic pressure on the surface of the eye, and the distension of the vessels within the eye, without necessarily entailing any conscious sensation, will have affected, through reflex action, the lacrimal glands. Finally, through the three principles of nerve force readily passing along accustomed channels, of association which is so widely extended in its power, and of certain actions being more under the control of the will than others, it has come to pass that suffering readily causes the secretion of tears, without being necessarily accompanied by any other action. Although in accordance with this view, we must look at weeping as an incidental result, as purposeless as the secretion of tears from a blow outside the eye, or as a sneeze from the retina being affected by a bright light. Yet this does not present any difficulty in our understanding how the secretion of tears serves as a relief to suffering. And by as much as the weeping is more violent or hysterical, by so much will the relief be greater. On the same principle that the writhing of the whole body, the grinding of the teeth, and the uttering of piercing shrieks, all give relief under an agony of pain. End of section 12